Okay, so let's get rolling. Um, first of all, I record all the lectures and I put them up on YouTube. So if you uh, are ever looking for a good way to go to sleep at night, you can listen to my lectures. And uh, maybe you had me in class before. Uh, is this your? How many of you? This is your first MSIT class. You've all had some. Who who else have we had? Okay. Copy. Okay. I'm way better than all that. They're, they're very boring. Four hours, you can't be, that's boring, right? I'm very entertaining. I mean, you got the turtles already. So if you didn't know the names of any of them, that's going to be a pop quiz at some point. Um, all right. So in any case, I record all my lectures. Uh, we'll probably go for um, about an hour, then take a 10-minute break, and then another hour, take a 10-minute break, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, I would plan on being here until... 10 p.m. most nights. I don't know what you were used to from the other classes, but uh, I'm, unless I'm ill or something, you're probably not getting out early. So I guess deal with it. Um, <laughs> whatever. Got to get your money's worth. Uh, so um, I'm Dr. Littman. You can call me Mike Littman. I don't care. I'm not very formal. Um, but you can call the other, I mean, the other profs might be more formal, so don't just take that as... Uh, free latitude to call them whatever, but I am not a formal person. So call me whatever. Let's see. This is the normal syllabus crap. It's up there on the uh, Blackboard. Go down to the grade breakdown stuff. All right, so every single week you're going to have two assignments. You're going to have a programming assignment. You're going to have a writing assignment. Every now and then, if the programming assignment I give is especially large, I might not give you a, a writing assignment. Um, but there's kind of two sides to this. Um, one hand, uh, a master's program needs to also have a writing emphasis, and part of that is for accreditation. Um, the other hand is many of you are going to try to get jobs here in the United States working in IT. And a weakness that many of you are going to have, whether you want to admit it or not, is speaking English, right? Communicating in English. So we want to give you lots of opportunities to practice. Having said that, um, one of the things I'm going to be looking for in these papers, I'm not going to, I don't care all that much about like a missing comma and, and stuff like that, but I'm going to be looking for it not being in broken English. Okay, so that means you need to have a friend read it, take it to the writing center, have somebody else read it, have somebody who you can rely on read it first and tell you whether this sounds like it's broken English or not so that you can improve. Okay, that makes sense? So when I give you an 80% or something like that on your, on your paper and you thought you worked really hard on it, I'm not just doing it to be mean. And I ultimately want you guys to graduate and go out and be able to get jobs and um, not have an employer turn you away because your written communication is poor. Make sense? All right, so I'd rather be a little mean to you now so that you can go and be successful and get good jobs later. All right, um, let's see. Programming assignments, um, some of them will be difficult and I do encourage you to work together in groups. Um, I will find out on this final exam whether you learn crap, all right? Uh, I'm not going to sit here and spend a whole lot of time trying to look for plagiarism and crap. I don't, I don't care. You're only hurting yourself. All right. Um, so bottom line is when I give you the final exam, uh, which will be an individual thing, I mean, you'll do really, really bad on it if you've just been copying off somebody the entire semester. And, you know, that's 20% of your grade. And all of you want B minuses. Well, actually, all of you want Bs are better in your MSIT class, but a minimum of a B minus. Otherwise, it doesn't even count as passing, right? Okay, so eh, that's not a whole lot of wiggle room there. You got to get points on that final. So <laughs> if you're going to cheat off somebody, at least learn something from the cheating process. All right, I'm not going to waste my time sitting there looking for a plagiarized paragraph or something like that because you know you're you're just hurting yourself. Um, all right, so questions about the grading, pretty straightforward. So every week you'll have two assignments, uh, paper, papers are, you know, two to three pages, something like that. Um, uh, sometimes it's three to five, but depends on the topic. Uh, programming assignments range from pretty simple, like this first week's uh, um, isn't, 
isn't too bad. Uh, we'll talk about it near the end of class, but uh, um, sometimes they'll be quite time consuming, especially if you haven't had computer programming before. I do assume that you've never seen computer programming. All right, so some of you may have had some programming before, so you're gonna be ahead of the curve. Okay, but I do talk about a lot of theory behind the hood, and I'm guessing it's stuff you haven't seen before. All right, even if you've done a lot of application programming, you, you've done the applied side of things, I'm gonna teach you some stuff that's underneath the hood why certain things work a, a certain way. If you've never done any programming, you're not behind the eight ball here. You're gonna be just fine. Okay, I mean, you might still suck at it because programming is hard, and we'll talk about why programming is hard here in a, in a, in a little bit. But uh, uh, I'm assuming that you've never seen programming before. All right, so that's what we're um, looking for here. Okay, and then the normal 90, 80, 70, grading scale, dealy, flippy, majig. Questions about the syllabus? All right. Having said that, um, so I'll be updating this because uh, I copied the course over from the last time I taught it. But as an example, this was when I taught it last spring, 2016. So you see all the lectures are up here and I break them into parts. So if you want to go back and watch last year's class and get ahead, you can. But I'm going to be reproducing them um, in here and I'll put the link up for this class, <laughs> I'll replace this. So this is last year's link, so uh, I haven't pre-recorded all these. So we'll be doing fresh recordings and um, I'll put those guys up. And uh, then when you're working on your homework or something like that, you can always reference back. Uh, we also use Slack here. How many of you have used Slack before? Okay, so Slack is a uh, kind of a chat roomy type thing. And on Slack, we have a, did I not create a 535 class yet? Looks like I didn't, so I'll go ahead and do that. CSC 535. Oh, it's gotta be lowercase. Yeah, it does already exist. So why don't I? Oh, it's one of my favorites. That's why it's not in here. Ha. Huh. Okay. So for those of you who, uh, so are you already on our Slack or you just, you have used Slack before? Okay. So for those of you who have not used Slack before, uh, what you'll do is you're going to go to, well, I'll actually use this here in a few minutes, actually. So you're going to go to cuwcs.slack.com. Okay. So write that down somewhere. You can do it right now if you want to. Um, so C-U-W-C-S, so Concordia University, Wisconsin, computer science, dot slack dot com. And this is going to ask you to sign in to C-U-W computer science. Well, you don't already have an account. So what you need to do is down here where it says create an account, you got to click on that guy. And then it wants you to put in your Concordia email address. So for me, it'd be michael.litman at C-U-W.edu. I already have an account, so that's not going to fly. And then it'll take you through the account creation process. All right. Once you're in, you can use Slack from a web page. You can use Slack using the native app for a Mac. You can use Slack using the native app, app for Windows. There's a Mac, uh, there's an app for Linux. There's an app for iPhone. There's an app for Android. There's an app for everything. All right. So, uh, and you can then set up push notifications on there. So my recommendation to you is once you get into our Slack thing, you'll see there's a whole bunch of, you know, classes here. So click on anything you're, you're, you might be interested in. Um, but definitely go into CSC 535 and up top here, I'm not sure what the default settings are because since I'm the admin, the default settings become a little different, but go up to channel settings. Um, you get to it different ways depending on which interface you're looking at, but make sure you go to notification preferences and I would probably set it up to get activity of any kind for at least this class. All right, because sometimes I'll be making announcements uh, on there. So, for example, if uh, uh, somebody brings up a, a, an important question about the homework and I give a hint or something like that, I'll post it to Slack and you'll all want to become aware of that, right? All right, so make sure that you have your Slack channel notification crap turned on. Okay, uh, Slack is also an excellent way for you to ask questions. 
So when you're working on your homework, if you do have questions, post it in the Slack channel. Post code in there. Like I said, the, at the end of the day, it's all about us learning, right? Okay. I don't care if you work in groups of two or three. If you had a lot of programming before and you're stronger, help the weaker people. And by teaching them, you'll learn something new. And the weaker folks will then learn something from you. Because sometimes you'll uh, you'll see me do it and it looks easy. And then, you know, like, okay, well, I didn't learn anything from it because he zipped through it too quick. So I have to cover material again and show you the solution to your homework all in the time period we have. So sometimes seeing it from a different person's perspective is helpful. Okay? Um, so in any case, post your questions right there in the 535 uh, uh, group. If you want to put code in there, you can do that. Uh, there's a little thing here where you can add a snippet. Um, let's see. What, yeah, code or text snippet. So actually, it'll keep your, your uh, um, Java code is what we're going to be using in here. It'll keep it formatted. Um, so it looks uh, decent. Um, you could also create private channels in here. So if you want to create a study group with two or three of you or something like that, where you guys just have discussion that everybody else doesn't see, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, keep in mind that I can still see it because I, the admin of all, all, all that is computer science <laughs> slack here. Um, but uh, feel free to, to do that. Uh, you can also send me private messages in here. Okay, um, so one thing I'm all about is communication. Uh, you know, I, I would go out on a limb and say I'm probably the easiest teacher on campus to get a hold of. Get me on Slack, text me. So let me open up uh, our PowerPoint here, which, and I'll give you a link directly to this guy, too. I'll replace the one that's on there from this past year. So this is CSC 535. I usually create a fresh um, presentation for each class because I kind of grow it organically. And sometimes we take different twists and turns depending on uh, where we're at. Um, but whatever, spring 2017. So right here. That is my personal cell phone number. Uh, you can call it if you want to, but I probably won't pick up. I only answer for my mom or my wife. Okay. Uh, the fact that my uh, iPhone can make phone calls is really something I don't even care about. <laughs> but text is an excellent way of getting a hold of me. If you have a question, uh, don't wait until the next class, especially since we only meet once a week. Okay. Text me. Ask me the question. I mean, I, I, I don't go to bed at 8 p.m. or anything, but, uh, you know, expect a pretty quick response between the hours of maybe 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. If I don't get back to you, let's say, within two hours, send it again. Uh, if you email me, so my email address is michael.litman, that's uw.edu. Uh, if you email me and you'll get a response, you know, in that period of time, um, within a couple hours, send it again. Bump it to the top of my inbox. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much of you guys write up me on LinkedIn and crap like that, but I, I run several companies. And um, so I get a lot of email. I probably get about 600 emails a day. And uh, I've sold most of my businesses, but as you might imagine, I'm still part of lots of different entrepreneurial type things. And then on top of that, I teach full time here. So I get a lot of uh, folks messaging me, but you are my top priority, my students. So if you don't get a response within a couple hours, send it again to bump it to the top of the, my inbox. Uh, don't you worry about bugging me, right? So don't feel like, oh, I don't want to bother him. Don't send it every five minutes, okay? <laughs> but if I don't get back to you within a couple of hours, that means it likely fell off my radar, okay? So send it again so I'll respond to you. If you text me the first couple of times you text me, just make sure I know who you are, what class you're in. That way I can add you to my, my contacts list so I kind of can answer your question in some context. You know, if you uh, tell me you're, you know, I have this question about your homework and I don't know that I'm dealing with a grad student versus, you know, somebody in one of my freshman classes, you know, the answers might come back a little bit different. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, I should be pretty easy to reach. A um, little bit about me. Uh, I've been teaching for, uh, I guess... 17 years now. 
teaching college for 17 years. Uh, I've been programming since I was nine. So I'm, I guess I'm okay at this stuff. And um, uh, so computer science isn't just my profession, it's probably also my hobby. Like I sit around at home, watch Netflix and write software. I run, um, well, I've sold most of my companies now, but I've run uh, several software companies uh, doing custom mobile applications, iPhone, Android uh, type stuff. We're gonna start off in here, uh, we're gonna be using Java as our core language. And then for those of you who stick around and go into the second class, 537, which I do recommend you do, and I'll explain why here in a few minutes, uh, we actually go and we learn how to do uh, Android development in there. Uh, the reality is, is I prefer iOS development. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, uh, if we use iOS development, then you have to have a Mac. And uh, that means that you either have to come into the lab down there and do your homework, well, we have a nice lab down there, but nobody wants to come into a lab and do their homework. You want to do your homework at home, right? So if we use Android, it doesn't matter what kind of computer you have. <laughs> Mac, you can get the Android development environment on there, PC, Linux, whatever, all right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with Android. It's not like it's crap. Just Apple is more polished, and it's because Apple controls the software and the hardware. So they, can make, they make a product to write code for this, and it just kind of works where... Google writes so uh, one piece of their thing, and then you have hardware created by 30 different companies, and then you have the, some of the software created by two other companies, and those things all have to kind of work together, and it's actually shockingly good considering the problem they're solving. Okay, um, so that's something to look forward to. We might actually, depending on how uh, the class starts going, we might actually start getting into some of the Android stuff uh, the second half of this course. Um, but I'm not going to promise that. It really just depends on kind of the dynamics of how things are going in here because uh, when we do get into Android, uh, then we're throwing this extra little curveball of kind of learning the, the, how to make the little Android interfaces and stuff like that. And that can be a little bit, uh, um, I guess, unnerving at first when for most of us, we're, this is going to be our first programming class. We're going to have enough to worry about. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'd rather uh, let you focus on the programming stuff and, um, you know, maybe bait you into the next class with the, uh, the Android stuff. Now, the reason I um, say that I think all of you should take the next class, because the next class is not required, the CSC 537. 535 is a required course. 537 is a continuation of this course, so we just pick up where we left off. But we also get into things like data structures, linked lists, stacks, queues, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter if you know what those are or not. Uh, we obviously will talk about them in there. Um, but a common misconception is that IT is not programming. Okay, Computer science is programming. IT is the other stuff. All right. That's not the case. In fact, I could actually make an argument that the programming you'll do in IT in many ways is more complex than the programming you would do as a normal computer science person. Because normal computer science folks, they go and they work for a company writing business applications, right? Writing Android apps or iPhone apps or websites, things like that, where they have tools where they can drag and drop buttons in. And a lot of the work, there's professional tools built for them to make their life easier. If you're an IT person, chances are the software you're writing is running on some switch that's buried in the basement all the way across the, the company. Okay, you're not going and sitting in front of that machine. You're remoted into that machine sitting in front of something that looks like this. Okay, and you're typing your code at effectively what looks like a DOS prompt. You don't have the fancy tools. Okay, you're not building, you know, fancy pretty interfaces. You're dealing with, you know, creating custom user accounts in bulk, deleting a bunch of things, um, doing reflexive access lists, all sorts of stuff. And... In many ways, that's even more intimidating to somebody than, um, I guess, sitting in front of a tool that was built for programming. You know, where it's you know just like a word processor. You know, you can make things look pretty good by just dragging pictures and crap in, and uh, the the words move all around it and stuff like that. It's half the stuff you don't have to do anymore, right? Okay, so the way I like to explain it typically is that uh, computer science is seventy five percent creation 25 percent using what's been created it is the flip side of the same coins it is 75 percent using what's been created 
25% creation. The creation is the programming piece. Okay, you're creating something new. All right, so 25% of your job as an IT professional is going to be programming, problem solving type stuff. 75% of your job on the computer science th side of things will be programming stuff. So if you happen to like programming a lot more, then you're more on the computer science side of things. If you happen to not really be a huge fan of programming after you come through this, know that you're still going to have to do it sometimes. So you need to be competent in it. But when you get into the IT workforce, sometimes you, you get that, you know, the, the programming person. You know, that one person at the office that just, they're the programmer. If we get a programming type problem, we throw it at them. Okay. I'm the, I'm the person who crawls underneath the, uh, the floorboards and goes and switches out a, uh, a router or something like that. You know, so you kind of find your, your little place. But uh, one thing I don't want you to think about is that IT means no programming. It's not the case. So you want to take as much programming stuff as you can. At the very least, that's going to make you uniquely qualified for some jobs and get you at least the interview. Okay? All right. Let me save this. I don't forget. So let's see. 35... Okay. Now, out of curiosity, um, how many of you have programmed before? Written any software whatsoever? Wow, zero. That's actually good. It actually is a good thing because uh, sometimes when you get those one or two people in the class who have done a bunch of stuff, then they kind of have to like have to make sure they don't answer everything. You know, because one of my hobbies is to see human misery. So like I want to ask you a question and then have you give me a stupid answer and then we all laugh at it. You know, it's 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 part of my entertainment. So no, that's actually good. So uh, um, hopefully, I, I, well, I think you'll enjoy the class. I think you'll find the class hard, but I think it'll be like this love-hate relationship type thing as we kind of uh, go through this. All right, so let's start off with this. What is programming? Tell me, tell, give me, give me your best shot. What do you think this is? And remember, I'm not really a formal person, so I'm not looking for some like highly technical, throwing as many buzzword things as you possibly can. Think as a person, tell me what you think programming is. What's your, what's your, uh, your gut feeling? Since none of you have done programming, um, what what are you coming in with? What's your expectation of what programming is? Oh, it's very excited participation here. We might be here until 11. Well, somebody say something. What do you think it is? Uh, it's just writing a bunch of commands for the machine to do something. Okay. So you're, you're writing like cryptic looking stuff, right? So it, it, it's going to look weird. It's not just normal. Like It's not like writing a paper. It's like weird symbols and stuff, right? And to tell the computer to go and do something. All right. I kind of like that. So, is the representation of logical thinking in a bunch of weird... Okay, so I liked when you started saying a bunch of weird stuff. The first part sounded like buzzwords, right? Um, so what is programming? It's a human telling a computer what to do. That's it. We got these machines sitting in front of us. And these guys are stupid, all right? But they're really, really fast. And they can do math really, really fast as long as we tell them exactly what we want them to do, all right? This is a tool. This is like you went into Home Depot and bought a power tool and you gotta come home and you gotta read the instructions and figure out how to use it, all right? So what is computer programming? It's us telling this dude what to do. Now we gotta learn how to do that, okay? So we have to use various tools for doing this. But now we have a problem. <laughs> All right. The problem. Our goal is to tell a computer what to do. But, and, and really this ultimately comes down to problem solving. The problem is this. All of us are expert problem solvers. 
maybe some better or worse than the other, but we're all expert problem solvers. But there's one big problem. We're expert problem solvers when we're working with human beings. We've spent our entire lives interfacing with other people. Let's say you're having a party at your house tonight. Well, tonight we got class, so we're having a party here. But let's say you're having a party at your house tomorrow. And you're going to invite your new and your best bud, Mike, over to your party. Now, you might say, okay, go down to Main Street and go down a couple of blocks. There'll be a gas station on the left. Just, just turn left there. And I'm like the fourth or fifth house down on the right. There's a pink car in the driveway. Now, if you told me those directions, as a human being, I could fill in the blanks and probably hunt and peck my way to the party, right? That's how we're used to solving problems. That's not going to fly for a computer. How many of you uh, got to class today without uh, bumping into any walls or falling over? You usually have one or two smart asses that say, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All of us did, right? All of us got to class, didn't bump into any walls, didn't uh, fall over. Any of you text while you were walking? Couple, probably several of you, right? All right, so is walking easy? Is it so easy it doesn't even deserve your full attention because you're texting while you're doing it? How many of you have been walking through a mall or something or you know, some busy hallway texting and you're bobbing and weaving out of people and you're not even looking in front of you, but you're still missing people. How? How did you do that? Is it just luck? You see, my grandpa, he was still driving while, uh, I mean, he's, he's uh, gone now, but uh, he was uh, still driving well, well past when his sight shouldn't have allowed him to drive. And you know how he'd switch lanes? He would uh, swerve in and out of the lane he wanted to go into and listen for the honk because his hearing was better than his vision. And then we found out he really couldn't hear very well either. <laughs> but that's how, he, that's how he kept from hitting people. He just listened for them to scream. So as you're, you're going with your cell phone, you're you know, just kind of zigging and zagging around and you know, just wait for people to tell you, hey, look out. Is that what you all do? Or do you kind of glance over your phone while you're walking down you know, this little tiny peak? You know, zig this Sometimes way. Or... you might expect that the other person would move. Oh, yeah. But see, see, my wife is very little. My wife's like 5'4", like 108 pounds or something like that. So she can't pull that off. Now, I am like a bulldozer. Yeah, I could just set myself in a lane and just go, and the, the, just the ocean's part, right? <laughs> so true story. So whenever we're in a crowded place, she just gets behind me. I just go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we all got to class today without, uh, without uh, bumping into any walls, without falling over, okay? Some of you texted, but you all did that by walking. Is walking easy? On a scale of 1 to 10. How difficult is walking? Is it something we probably take for granted now? You think a five? So kind of a mediumly difficult thing? Cool. All right, so explain to me. Assume I don't know how to walk. Tell me how. How do I walk? Remember, we're talking about the problem here. That you're all really, really good at explaining to people how to solve problems. Now, I'm a computer. Tell me how to walk. Okay. So you want me to stand. So let's assume we went through the one-hour conversation of you telling me how to stand. Okay, so I'm standing. Now, now what? I'm just, I'm just going that way. <laughs> hey, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. I, I just want to, I want to take four steps that way. Four steps. I don't even need to, is four steps even considered walking? If I go four steps without falling down, that's, that's walking, right? All right, so I want to do four steps down this uh, little path here. How do I do that? You usually you get something like put one foot in front of the other or something like that, right? It's like, okay, well, I will. How do, how do you do that? If I want to put my left foot forward first, what's involved in putting my left foot forward? 
I'll just like hope the brain knows what to do. Takes takes care of it. Is there a lot of stuff involved in taking your left foot and putting it forward? There's all sorts of muscles involved. Most of them we can't pronounce, right? I mean, we've got zillions of, I don't think it's zillions. We've got a bunch of muscles in our leg, right? And they're all involved in that. And then you got your, you know, your, your inner ear and keeping your balance. I mean, you got all sorts of stuff that, I mean, when you're walking, you're not thinking about flexing your calf muscle and tensing your quadriceps. You're not thinking about all that stuff. You just do it, right? But there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that play into walking that isn't even worth our time. This dude's over here texting, okay? He's not thinking about his legs or what muscle or his inner ear that's keeping him upright. He's not thinking about any of that. It's boring. It's beneath him, okay? We're great problem solvers as people. The problem is, and this is the problem, humans are so good at solving problems that we have forgotten how to articulate how we solve them. We have difficulty articulating all the individual steps because we skip so many of them. It's boring for us. We're smart. We can fill in those blanks, those directions you gave me to that party. Who cares if they weren't precise? So it takes me an extra five minutes because I make the wrong left turn or something like that. Eventually, I'll find the pink car, right? No problem. I'll get to the party. Human being can do that. And because we're so used to working with other human beings, we don't need to be that precise on a daily basis. Okay? This is, you know, our natural languages are, the, uh, are a good example. And this always works great in our grad classes since, you know, many of you speak other languages other than English. In fact, for many of you, English was not your first language, right? Okay, so how many of you in here speak a language other than English? Most of you, right? Okay. Now, when you're talking to your friends in that other, like, other language, so uh, some of you probably speak uh, Hindi. We got Urdu. Uh, te Tegelu? Yeah. Te did I say that right? Telugu. Telugu. I only speak Urdu. I don't do the Telugu stuff. Except one, everyone speaks Telugu. Huh? Except one in our class, everyone speaks Telugu. Everybody in here speaks Telugu? Except one. Except one? No. You don't speak Telugu? You're just Urdu like me. Yeah. One of my other students, uh, Shiva. Um, any of you know Shiva? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so him and I have been to the, some Indian place downtown. And uh, he starts ordering in Hindi, and I act like I'm all offended. And like, oh, no, no, I don't know what you're ordering. I only speak Urdu, so let's, let's, let's do this again. You know, and the guy starts, you know, talking to me, and I, <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. I speak English and bad English, and enough Spanish to, like, order at Taco Bell. So, um, but, you know, it's kind of funny that, you know, he, these people there think I speak Urdu, but you know, I don't. But in any case, when you're talking to your friends in Telugu or Urdu or Hindi, you're using the same sort of thought process as if you're speaking to somebody in English. Just the words that are coming out of your mouth are different, you know. You say things like, hey, I'm hungry. Do you want to go eat? You just say it in Telugu versus English, right? You're still thinking about talking to a person on the other end. You're just using different syntax. Same thing's true with computer programming, okay? Programming is programming. The language does not make a difference. We happen to be using Java in here as our example language, but that doesn't matter. We can use C++. We can use Swift or Objective-C or Python. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. Okay? Just like English solves the same problem as Hindi, solves the same problem as Spanish, solves the same problem as French, they all solve the problem of letting two people talk to each other. They just have to agree upon one of those languages, right? Okay. But we're so good at solving problems as people. We're so good at talking to other people that we've gotten bad at filling in all the blanks. We've gotten bad at being able to articulate all those little tiny details to the, with solutions to problems, right? That's why learning to be a computer programmer is difficult because we have to go back and we have to slow our minds down. We've got to fill in those little baby steps. Okay, so now... 
let's put things in perspective. So let's say that I uh, gave you your first homework assignment. And let's say it was to write, uh, we play, do any of you play video games in here? Uh, so what, like Call of Duty, uh, you know, games with lots of, you know, crazy graphics and explosions and all that stuff. So, you know, complex looking games, right? All right, so let's say that your homework assignment due in one week was to write a super complex game like that. Most of you would drop the class, <laughs> right? Because our perception is to write Call of Duty, which took, you know, several hundred programmers a couple of years to write, must be extremely complex, must be a really, 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 really difficult thing to write. Wouldn't that be your assumption? Yeah, it must be hard. So writing a game like that is trivial compared to walking. So the point is, is that we're not solving problems with our computers. They're anywhere near as complex as walking. Even the hardest problems that we use our computers to solve isn't as difficult as walking, which is good because we all kind of failed miserably when you tried to teach me how to walk. Right? Even when we were trying to break it down to those little baby steps, we recognize that the number of details that it takes to actually accomplish walking is high. <laughs> right? There's a lot of things going on, and some of it we kind of uh, fell into, probably pun intended, right? So sometime as babies, we figured out how to stand up, and we kept falling over. Then we got a little bit better at not falling over, and eventually we started moving while not falling over, and now we're walking, right? We don't know how. It just happened. We, <laughs> you know, nowhere do we have a checklist like, okay, I got, I got to do this muscle, then this muscle, then this muscle, then I got to do these. We don't have that checklist somewhere that we've forgotten. We just sort of stumbled into walking, literally. So the problems that we solve in our computers are problems that human beings do need to be able to conceive upon. We need to be able to break those down into their individual baby steps, which means they're problems that are far, far, far more trivial than just walking. Okay? Walking is hard. Writing a really complex video game is not hard. It might be time consuming. Most of that time is spent doing mundane things. Easy things that's kind of grunt work. All right, but every now and then you got a problem that seems to be more complex. All right, so that's our problem. So let's get to this guy. Programming language. Now we talked about natural languages a few minutes ago. Talked about uh, tele Telugu. Telugu and Urdu and Hindi and English and Spanish and French. These are all natural languages, right? Built for a human being to talk to another human being. Now, is learning a, uh, a new natural language difficult? A lot of times it's human motivation, right? If somebody dumped you in the middle of a city that uh, had a language that, that spoke a language that you didn't speak, you probably learned pretty quick uh, how to communicate with those people there uh, because you already know how to deal with people. You know, you'd probably use facial expressions and stuff like that at first or, you know, you go to the bathroom, you just like point to your butt or something like that, you know, and they get the point. Okay. But eventually, probably pretty quickly, you're going to pick up the language, right? Out of desperation. So really, learning a natural language is not all that difficult. Most of us, when you go and try to get one of those pieces of software and learn a natural language, we start recognizing that people are also lazy, right? We don't put the time in that we need to. Um, and we're, not, uh, we're not out of desperation, like, you know, well, you know, I don't need to learn these things in order to feed myself, so well, I'm going to go to the movies <laughs> instead of uh, study. But the purpose of these natural languages are for us to communicate with other people. Now, we already understand the mechanics of talking to people. We just, when we learn a new natural language, we just need to learn the new sounds or the alphabet, you know, the, the, for that language. When we're dealing with computer programming, we're learning two things. Okay. We don't already know how to talk to a computer. So all of us have to slow down our thinking. Since none of us are computer programmers, we, all, we have to slow down our thinking so that we can talk to this dude. 
break problems down to little tiny steps. And then at the same time, I'm also learning this new language, okay? The syntax that allows me to speak to this thing. All right, so programming languages, these are tools that allow humans to tell a computer what to do without them having to change the way they solve problems too much. We are not very flexible. Human beings are not very malleable. We're willing to get a little bit technical and a little bit geeky when we're going to start talking to a computer, but we're not dropping down to the whole zeros and ones level, right? It's not going to happen. Right, so really, if you want to create this language for us to talk to a computer, so right now we're, we're speaking English, right? All right, we're on an equal playing field. You guys understand English, I understand English. We're equals, okay? Now, when we're talking to the computer, the computer understands zeros and ones, machine language. I've heard of zeros and ones. I don't know machine language. Am I gonna drop down to the machine level language? and talk to this guy directly? Nope. I'm gonna talk way up here. And I need somebody in between to tell this guy what actually happens, All right? I'm not dropping down to this idiot's level. I'm a person. I don't do that, okay? I want you to give me a tool that allows me to not have to change too much, but still be able to tell this guy what to do. That's what programming languages do. Now, programming languages come in three flavors. So we have three kinds of programming languages. We've already discussed machine language. Zeros and ones. So we get the little two button keyboard out there, right? Just zeros and ones, just tapping them out, tapping them out. How many of you would uh, last more than 15 seconds as a programmer if you just had to just all day long tap out zeros and ones? None of us, right? We would be insane after two minutes if we were lucky. Okay. Now, how long would it be until we made our first error? If everything we did had to be either a zero or a one and the order had to be extremely precise, how long until we screwed up the first time? Pretty quick. Okay. That's not really in a human being's uh, wheelhouse. Okay, that's not a strong point for us to have that level of attention where we're not going to screw up. I mean, our, our hand's going to get tired, first of all, right? You know, and then, you know, we're, our mind's going to start wandering and then, you know, you got you to check, you got to check Facebook. So, I mean, <laughs> you might be in the middle of a, you know, a 128-bit binary string and now you're, you're replying to something on Facebook. You lost where you were, right? So... Machine language, not really for us. But at the end of the day, that's what this guy needs. Digital logic, on or off, true or false, zero or one. At the very end of the day, that's what this computer understands, zeros and ones. So we have low-level languages. This guy has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. Oh, well, what does that mean? Well, let's go here. What's the CPU? What is the CPU? Computer's brain. Computer's brain, okay. I'm actually pretty impressed because usually the very first answer you get is the central processing unit. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you hear an acronym, you always got to say what it means. Just, okay, so this is a central processing unit. It's the computer's brain, okay. What does it do? How many of you have a computer? Most of you, right? And how many of those computers have a CPU in it? All of them? Can you have a computer without a CPU? Needs its brain, right? Oh, so what does the CPU do? So since all of you have a computer, and every one of those computers has a CPU, so you, you've worked with CPUs a lot, I assume, right? Probably a lot today. For some of you, surely you'll know what a CPU must do. 
What does it do? Interprets the commands. Oh, okay. What? Okay, tell me. Tell me more. What commands? Hmm. Okay, commands given by humans. All right, so so at some point I, I need to tell this guy what to do, and it's that CPU that's going to interpret what I'm telling it. All right, fair enough. How does it interpret it? Now, what kind of things can I tell a computer to do? Can I walk up to my computer and tell it to roll over? Like a dog? Can I tell it to play dead? Can I tell it to jump? What does this dude understand? Oh, what, what kind of instructions? All right, so somebody made a list of instructions, a list of things that the uh, computer knows how to do, and that CPU has those lists of commands, those, those lists of instructions, right? I like to think of a CPU as a collection of magic tricks that when called in a particular, particular order, something significant occurs. Okay, so we got this CPU sitting there. We put some electricity into it, so it's kind of like ready to go. And it maybe knows how to do, let's say, 100 different things, 100 different magic tricks. All right, so things like roll over or play dead, but instead of roll over and play dead, it's going to be more computer geeky things, like moving something from one place in memory to another place in memory. Okay, or testing some value for against zero, stuff like that. Okay, so little tiny granular magic tricks that do enough to be useful, but don't do too much. Because if we do too much, then you can't necessarily use them to solve general purpose problems. Okay, so our CPU is a collection of magic tricks that in and of themselves maybe don't seem all that useful. But when you Use those tricks together. When you use those uh, those instructions, those commands together, you can actually accomplish something. All right. So when I say that we have a low-level language that has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU, what I'm saying is is that every line of code that we write in a low-level language translates into one of those magic tricks. That makes sense. So rather than talking to the computer at the zero and one level where, you know, a zero or a one is a subparticle of a magic trick, kind of like the atomic level, if you will, okay, rather than talking at that level, we're going to talk to it on a one-to-one -one basis, okay? CPU, I want you to do this little magic trick, then that little magic trick, then that little magic trick, and then once we've done about 250 or 300 of them, something very simple has just happened. Ha, we're a programmer. So let's look at an example here. All right. So for starters, this is assembly language. Okay, assembly language is a low-level programming language, which means it has a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. Specifically, this is assembly language for the Intel processor running on the Linux operating system why does it matter why does it ma why does the processor in the operating system have anything to do with it well she mentioned that the instructions are the things that the cpu understands right okay so these are the instructions move move int these guys these are the instructions that the intel processor understands but it's also important that we know what operating system we're we're operating in why do you think that is? Shouldn't I be able to write this program and talk to the CPU directly on a one-to-one -one basis, whether I am writing it for Windows or the Mac or for Linux? Should it matter? What is an operating system? What's that guy?
Okay, good start. Is this like any other software or is it something special about operating systems? What's special about an operating system? How does Windows make your life easier? Or how does the Mac operating system make your life easier? What makes Windows different than Microsoft Word? Microsoft Word software as well, right? It's software for doing a very specific task, word, word processing stuff. What task does an operating system perform? Ah, communication between human and hardware. Interface between human and hardware, okay? Because we're not so good. If I just took the screen and everything apart and I just had a motherboard sitting in front of us, we wouldn't be all that great at working with that. You know, taking a little, got some electricity here and electricity here, and just, we're gonna just, just touch right there. Get a little zap and we don't know what happens, right? We're not good at that. Especially when we start getting into very large scale integration type stuff like today. Inside this computer is billions of transistors, right? You know, you go back to the old, old, old days of computers where you had like EDVAC and UNIVAC way before transistors where you basically had these things that were the size of gymnasiums with light bulbs plugged into them. Then working with the computer directly was uh, a little bit more, you know, a little bit easier. You go and you screw a light bulb in. Ha! I've done something, right? It was something trivial because those giant machines that were the size of gymnasiums are, you know, far less complex than many of our smart toasters today. Isn't it funny that a smart toaster actually exists? There are smart toasters. Do we really need smart toasters? I saw a toaster on Amazon one time that would, it, it would, on your bread, toast the headline of the top news story. Do you need that? How does the bread get in the toaster? I think we have, we have to put it in there. But then the toaster talks to the internet, probably USA Today or something like that, or who knows, Facebook or Google, whatever, to get the, 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 the headline. And then it burns it onto the toast, the headline. There was another toaster where I think you can stick a USB stick in it, and it will take any picture, and it will put that picture in, in toast art, I guess, onto the toast. Is that something we've been missing? But we have them, we have smart toasters. Okay, those smart toasters are way, way, way more powerful than those gigantic computers that were the size of gymnasiums. Because that was before we had transistors. So we used to be able to directly manipulate computers by screwing in the light bulbs, screwing in the vacuum tubes. Can't do that anymore. Now we have transistors and they're smaller than we can even see. There's billions of them. We're not that precise. So we need something that sits between us and that hardware so that we can accomplish something. That's what the operating system is. So now what are some things that we expect our computer to be able to do for us? So inside of this fancy box here that's guarded by Ninja Turtles, Donatello and Leonardo, those specific Ninja Turtles. You remember that, right? All right, it's gonna be on a quiz next time, we'll see. I'll, I'm going to switch up the stickers. So next time I'll bring back new turtles and he's going to get it wrong. He's like, oh, every turtle's the same. All right, so inside of this we have, you know, complex looking stuff. Now we've already agreed that we can't really manipulate those things directly. We need the software to do it. So what are some things that we want that operating system to do for us? What are things that we expect Windows and the Mac operating system to be able to do for us? Somebody said it acted as an interface between the human and the hardware. Fine. So just like we were talking about what kind of commands does the CPU understand, now I'm asking what kind of commands does the operating system understand? Can I tell it to roll over and play dead? I was trying to think about the nature of computing here. Okay, open, open files. Close files, write stuff to hard drives and disks and things like that, or write stuff to the screen, write stuff to a printer. So we're doing a lot of writing. We're doing a lot of reading. 
So I.O. stuff. So input output stuff, right? So we take input from mice and from keyboards and from USB sticks and from whatever else, scanners. We have outputs to screens, to printers, to USB sticks, to hard drives. Okay. We have output to speakers. So it's all about controlling input and output. Moving stuff from one place to another place. And since we don't have the you know, dexterity to do that directly, we rely on that software to do that for us. Okay? So we kind of have two things that we're working with here. One of them is the primitive piece, that CPU. So the CPU is a collection of primitive magic tricks. All right? It does very tiny little things, little granular problems. In and of themselves might be, I want to move this little piece of data from here to here. And when you just look at that magic trick, you're like, why? Why would you want to do that? We don't have the why yet. Because I have to also move this to here, and this to here, and this to here, and then I need to do this, 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 and this. And then you will see the magic trick happen. Not until I've called 15 or 20 magic tricks in a row will you actually recognize what I've, what I've been doing. Because each one was relatively meaningless in and of itself. Make sense? Now, this program here is the Hello World program in Linux assembly. So at the end of the day, all this crap you see here makes the word Hello World show up on the screen. It does that. Okay, makes that show up on the screen. It doesn't do a whole lot. Okay? Now, this is going to be even scarier. This program is using a very, very, very powerful power tool. We've taken a shortcut here. This is the easy version of the Hello World program in assembly language. Does it look that easy? I mean, better than a wall of zeros and ones. That would be worse, right? If it was just all zeros and ones up here. Okay. But this doesn't necessarily look like something you want to be doing on your daily on a daily basis. Certainly closer than if you just had to work with zeros and ones. But I'm telling you that we're using a power tool here. We've gone to Home Depot. We bought a really expensive saw or, or drill or something. And we're using it to complete this problem rather than doing it all by hand. And that power tool is the operating system. So what we're going to see here as we go through this, to try to kind of appreciate low-level languages and how they work and why we still don't want to use them, because, you know, human beings, we're really lazy. You know, I, I promise you that uh, underneath low-level language here, we're going to have something called a high-level language. That's our sweet spot. Okay, we like high-level languages. All right, we'll get to that. So let's talk about what this program is doing and how it's working. So we can understand that the nature of how CPUs work together with operating systems. Now, wait a minute. We're talking about programming. Remember we started off uh, this conversation, I kind of said something that a lot of IT folk um, believe that IT and programming have nothing to do with each other. When they actually have a whole lot to do with each other. How many people do you think are in the IT industry who couldn't answer those questions about what a CPU is and what an operating system is? They know how to fix a printer. They know how to install some spyware or something like that. I mean, they, they know how to do applied things, but they don't understand what's happening under the hood. That's the difference between somebody who does something in an applied world versus somebody who's getting a theoretical degree as a master's degree who understands what's happening under the hood. And then you can apply that to solve larger problems. So this little example here is going to tell us the nature of how CPUs work in conjunction with operating systems to solve real problems. Okay? So, to start off with, we're just going to glance at this bottom couple lines here. We don't have to worry about them too much. What's being created here is two little variables. One variable is called MSG. That's that holds the message that we want to display on the screen. It holds hello world. 
The other variable is called len. That's the length of hello world. All right. So effectively, I'm saying I'm going to remember two little pieces of information over here. I'm going to remember that the message I want to put on the screen is hello world. And I'm also going to keep track of how long that is. I think I counted it earlier. Is that 13 characters? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13. So len holds 13. All right. I know the message and I know how long it is. Two little pieces of information. We've just written them down on a couple of post-it notes over here. All right. So forget about that part on the bottom now. I just have those written on post-it notes. These are our instructions, the stuff that comes right after the little start command there. Okay. Now, the, this is not something you have to learn or memorize. Okay. I mean, I'm never going to test you on this, but this is going to give you an appreciation for how this stuff works. All right. And this is way more important than you might be thinking it is right now. Notice that the first four things we do here is calling upon the same magic trick on the CPU. One of the things the CPU knows how to do is move things. It can move things from one place to another place. Okay. The first thing I'm going to tell the CPU to do is I'm going to tell it to move the number 13. You know, if I wrote 13 down to that little post-it note, I want to move that value here, wherever that is. Those guys are called hardware registers. It's a place in memory that lives on the CPU. Not that important for how registers work and stuff like that. Just know that the CPU has a couple of little buckets where it can remember things. Okay? And one of those buckets is called EDX. So I'm going to put the number 13 inside of this little place on the CPU. For no good reason. I just happened to put it there. Then I'm going to put hello world in this little bucket, ECX. Then I'm going to just haphazardly put the number 1 in EBX. So as far as we're concerned right now, based on what we know as beginning programmers, since I've given you the information letting you know that these are three values, this is 13, this is hello world, this is 1. We already knew about the literal 1. We all had seen the number 1 before we came here to class today. See, nothing new there, right? See, we're already halfway there. We've taken three values, and we've just thrown them in a couple of buckets. So we put one value here, another value here, another value here. Then we're taking haphazardly again the number 4. We're putting it in this place. So what have I done at this point? I'm, if I'm, I've, sh I've shrunk down a lot. Okay, I'm, I'm at the CPU level. And I'm standing on the CPU and the CPU over here on the side has a bunch of little buckets. Okay, these are the memory places the CPU knows. So I've, I've walked over to one of those buckets, I've dropped a 13 in. I've walked over to another bucket, I've dropped hello world in. Walked over to another bucket, I just put a one in there. I've just kind of put some stuff in some buckets. I might as well be at the playground. Okay, and the sandbox stuff. Okay, so I've put some stuff in some buckets. Then I put the number four in a bucket. Those were all the same magic trick. Just move, 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 move. I just move crap around. And I clap a little bit, everybody's happy. Then, ah, our first new magic trick. Int. This is interrupts the CPU. So, and then this command that's after this, this x80. That is the, um, uh, the special call that the Linux operating system listens for, right? So if the Linux operating system had a name, that would be its name. So when the CPU screams out x80, the Linux operating system wakes up. So when we hit this command right here, this magic trick is kind of the CPU going <clears throat> x80. And the operating system looks around and says, okay. Time to spring into action. What does the operating system do first? It runs over and it looks inside that little bucket, EAX, and it finds a four in there. It's like, oh, a four. Wow. Now, four probably means something to Linux, right? Didn't mean anything to us except that we know that the number four is equal to the number four. But the number four in Linux happens to be one of the Linux, it's the numeric version of one of the Linux system calls. It's the syswrite system call. So that's one of the things that Linux knows how to do. It knows how to write stuff to some output. 
All right. Now, one interesting thing, and this is more of an extra trivia thing. How many of you have seen that word before? POSIX. I'll use it in a sentence. How about that? It's like the spelling bees, right? Linux is a POSIX operating system. Okay. Unix is typically a POSIX operating system as well. Mac OS is a POSIX operating system. So interesting word. You'll see this sometimes, especially in the IT world. POSIX operating systems kind of have a, a telltale sign. They treat everything as a file. Everything's a file in a POSIX operating system. It's kind of just the nature of how they solve problems. So if you know that an operating system is a POSIX operating system, you know that pretty much everything will have something called a file descriptor. I think it's OR, descriptor. You'll often see this is just FD. So if you plug in a USB drive, on Windows, which is not a POSIX operating system, you plug in a USB drive, it shows up as like the E drive or the D drive or something like that. Usually has a little name like, you know, my jump drive or whatever. Okay. Windows is not a POSIX operating system, which is fine. POSIX doesn't mean better. It just is the nature of the operating system. But on the Mac OS, which maps it, right? What did Apple do? Apple took, uh, um, uh, you know, a funny thing that always comes up is people say that, oh, well, you know, the uh, uh, Macs don't have viruses. Have you heard that before? Okay, now we're all going to be IT professionals in here, right? And when somebody comes up to you and says, Macs don't have viruses, what do you say? Are they right? Are they wrong? Realistically, most of you probably don't know, but do you think you probably should know at least by the time you graduate? So what are you going to say? Anybody have a good response? If I came up and said, you know, I've heard that Macs don't have viruses. So shouldn't I get a Mac? What do you think? It's just a very talkative group. Am I too low energy for you? I'm not keeping you up? I'd be like, give me a minute, I'll Google it. You'll, you'll Google it? Give me a minute, I'll Google it? So uh, we have a couple. Uh, how many people are Mac users in here? Got, we got one, two. So why, why, are you, why are you a Mac user? The interface? Okay, so, so it really isn't the operating system under the hood. You like the way you interact with it. Okay. So earlier, somebody talked about that our operating systems, it's an interface between the human being and the hardware. Now, the reality is when I say Mac OS or I say Windows, we're actually not talking about operating systems there. We're talking about distributions. So Mac OS 10, this is what, what, is it, what are we on? 10.11 now? Sierra? Is that the, is that the current one? 10.12. Uh, so this is the 12th version of Mac OS 10. Okay, so... Uh, 12 versions ago, when Mac OS 9 became Mac OS 10, Apple made a, uh, a big change. And we're talking about the history of computing. I'm not going to go too far into that because some of this stuff should be covered by your, uh, some of your other classes. But when we went from Mac OS 9 in the, uh, it was probably in what, like 1990, no, no, yeah, 1998, 1999, something like that. We went from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS 10, what was the major difference? It's kind of around the time Steve Jobs came back to, uh, to Apple. We all know who Steve Jobs is, right? Apple guy, right? He's dead now, but an important historical figure is when it comes to computing. So what happened when we went from OS 9 to OS 10? What happened? Just the next version. Now it does seem like, if you uh, if you stare at this one more time, 
seem like we've kind of been sitting on OS X for a while here. 12 versions of this operating system. Remember they had Tiger and Lion and Mountain Lion and, and Leopard and Snow Leopard and Puma. Then they ran out of cats, right? And then they, uh, what was it, Mavericks and Yosemite. I went Yosemite, then Mavericks, now Sierra. When they first announced uh, Yosemite and one of Apple's um, keynote things, they had a pretty funny joke. Uh, Apple made the funny joke where they um, were talking about, because uh, the last version had been Mountain Lion. Uh, and so they were like, you know, we're starting to run out of cats. So we were thinking, what should we name the next Mac OS? Anybody know what the joke Apple used to us? Like maybe Mac OS Sea Lion. I showed a sea lion there with a beach ball. <laughs> so they didn't go that route. They started calling it other stuff. But we've been stuck on Mac OS 10 for 12 versions. Now before this, we had Mac OS 6, Mac OS 7, Mac OS 8, Mac OS 9. Then we went to Mac OS 10 or Mac OS X. You know, that's what it, they always put the little X in there, right? Okay, so um, what was the major difference there? When we went from Mac OS 9 to Mac OS X. Okay. I had multitasking before that. Would you believe that Apple stole something? No. So we've heard, we've heard of, we've heard of Steve Jobs, right? Did Steve Jobs always work for Apple? What happened to Steve Jobs? Apple. Steve Jobs founded Apple, right? He was Apple's you know, original finder with him, him and uh, Wozniak, right? They were the co-finder co-founders of Apple. But after that point, did he always work for Apple? What happened to him? What happened to Steve Jobs? He got fired from his own company. How does that happen? How do you get fired from your own company? Well, product didn't fail. I mean, he was a lunatic. Nobody wanted to work with him. But everything that he did ultimately ended up working out pretty well, which is hard to work with. When a company becomes publicly traded, it's not owned by a person anymore. It's run by a board of directors that answers to the shareholders, right? So the board of directors came to Steve Jobs, specifically the representative of the board of directors, the guy that Steve Jobs handpicked as the CEO of Apple. It was the previous... Uh, a CEO of Pepsi. He came to Steve Jobs. There was actually a famous quote along the lines of that one. So when he came to the CEO of Pepsi, he said, do you want to change the world or do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? So he came over to Apple and then turned around and fired Steve Jobs. Now, was that good for Apple? Apple almost failed as a company. What did Steve Jobs do when he was fired from Apple? Well, he didn't own the idea. He did a couple things. He was first of all, he had a buddy, um, George Lucas. Everybody in here has heard of George Lucas. Everybody in here has heard of Star Wars. George Lucas is a Star Wars guy. Okay? He, he's the one who made Star Wars. Well, George Lucas was going through a kind of a rough divorce at the time. Needed some, needed some money. So he sold a little company he had to uh, Steve Jobs. You've probably never heard of the company. Pixar? Heard of Pixar? Yeah. Little tiny company. So Steve Jobs kind of made some movies. Toy Story and other really popular, famous, big money-making movies. He bought Pixar for $7 million. 
sold it something like uh, I think like twelve years later or thirteen years later for like eight and a half billion, and still was on the on the board, still ran the company. That was a good investment, but he did something else. The Pixar thing was more of a hobby. Steve Jobs went out and founded a company called Next Computers. Have you heard of Next Computers? And I promise we'll take a break here fairly soon. I just want to get us to a good stopping point. Next Computers. Let's go to images here. Oh, look at this guy. Who is that guy? That's Steve Jobs. Look how excited he looks. It's my new computers. This is Next Computers. Big problem with, uh, back then, the problem with Apple, well, the perceived problem with Apple, is that Apple was proprietary, right? They wrote software for their own hardware. It was closed source, you know, so, so if you were a Windows user and you had a floppy disk that you wanted to take and put into a Mac, it wouldn't work. They, they spoke different languages. Okay, we got Telugu over here, and we got uh, French over here, and not not speaking the same uh, same thing. So you put a PC disc into a Mac, we want to format it. Like, this, this isn't even a disc. And so Steve Jobs, one of his ideas was, hey, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Unix operating system, been around for a while, it's done pretty well. I'm gonna try to make something targeted kind of at universities education that bridges that gap that allows both Mac and PC people to be able to use one machine. Now, they were really expensive. And you think it, I mean, is Next Computer still around today? How many of you have heard of Next Computers today before, right now? None of you? You haven't heard of Next Computers? Well, so Apple started failing. Um, actually, you know, let's do this. Let's do this. Just so I remember. Let's take a 10 minute break. Otherwise, you're going to all have to pee. All right. So 10 minute break. Come back at uh, 737 and we will keep trucking. <laughs> 